Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, our webinar on opening the economy and fixing the childcare crisis. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to be able to discuss this important topic. My name is Shelley Mazur, and I'm the California State Director for the Council for Strong America. Council for Strong America unites three organizations of valued leaders that you'll hear from in law enforcement, retired generals and admirals and business leaders to promote evidence-based policies and programs that help kids lead healthy, well-educated and productive lives. I'm joined today by CSA Research Director, Dr. Sandra Bishop. We have Senator Connie Leva, First Five Associations Executive Director, Melissa Stafford-Jones, our Mission Readiness Member, Rear Admiral Frank Pons, our Fight Crime Investing Kids Member, Chief Abdul Pridgen, and Ready Nation member Laura Parmer Lohan. We're releasing our new report, Want to Strengthen a California's Economy, Fix the Child Care Crisis, which focuses on the economic and social impact of access to child care and the repercussions of the current landscape in our state. So, what has the research shown us? I'm going to give you a headline. Dr. Bishop will give us a detail. And the headline, which is not a surprise to most of us, is that we have a serious child care crisis in California. Finding affordable, accessible, and high quality childcare is one of the most pressing issues that working parents of young children face today, and I would say school age children as well. The stakes are not only high for working families, but for infants and toddlers who depend on nurturing, stimulating environments for healthy brain development. The stakes are high for employers, many of which have been devastated by the pandemic, who accrue tremendous costs as a result of inadequate childcare. How high are the stakes? Well, our report notes that the projected annual cost of lack of reliable childcare in California is $9.1 billion, and that's pre-COVID. In terms of access, California is home to close to 2.5 million children under the age of four. This represents 13% of our nation's young children. Most recently, the California Master Plan for Early Learning and Care, just released earlier this week, shared that 22 of our counties have 90% or more unmet needs for infants and toddlers who are income eligible. We also know that in the last decade, our state has lost 91,000 of the 1.1 million licensed spaces available in the year. It's a really sobering reality. In terms of affordability, many parents are paying the equivalent of a year of public college tuition to place their infant in high quality childcare. For myself, I'm the mom of three, and I certainly remember paying more than my mortgage in childcare. For working families and low-income parents, single parents, or parents who have been deeply affected by our health and economic crisis, childcare costs are competing with paying rent and putting food on the table. And in terms of quality, the lack of or insufficient childcare for parents has forced parents to create patchwork systems to meet their needs. Infants and toddlers might be cared for by one parent one day, a grandparent or care, another caregiver another day, a provider or, or in another. And although most of these parents are doing their absolute best to take care of their children, this can lead to instability and stress for everyone involved in this ecosystem. With that, I'd like to turn things over to the lead researcher for our study, our Council for Strong America Director of Research, Sandra Bishop, who's gonna provide us with an overview of the report. Sandra, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Um, here we go. So right there you see a, the uh, front page of our report that I'm going to be giving you the brief highlights on today. For the study described in the report, Ready Nation commissioned a national survey of working parents of children under the age of three to discover how challenges with their childcare impacted parents' work lives. Survey respondents were asked questions about how childcare problems for their children under age three had impacted their work. For example, you see a couple of the um, questions that we asked over the past three months. How often have you been late to work because of problems with childcare? There were also questions about missing work or having to um, leave early or in addition to coming late. There are also more long-term questions looking at things like since your child under three was born or adopted, have you been let go or fired? Or have you been had to turn down a promotion or um, forego additional training because of problems with childcare? And we had over 800 parents and there were equal numbers of um, mothers and fathers, which is unusual for this kind of survey. 
Once we had the survey data, we conducted an economic analysis on the results to calculate the losses associated with inadequate infant and toddler childcare. The results are on the slide here, and they were really astounding. First, over 86% of parents said that problems with childcare hurt their time or effort at work. And this translated into $57 billion lost each year in earnings, productivity, and revenue. Parents, as you can see here, took the biggest hit, $37 billion in lost revenue, lost income. Meanwhile, businesses lost about $13 billion per year due to uh, extra hire, hiring costs and lost revenue. And then finally, taxpayers lost about $7 billion a year. And this was due to uh, decreased tax revenues due to decreased parent income. And these figures represent an underestimate of the impact of childcare because as I mentioned, we look just at parents of children under age three where childcare issues extend well beyond age three as we all know. Finally, we decided to look at uh, a projection of what this might look like in California. And given California's share of the US population and gross domestic product, the lack of reliable childcare for working parents of children up to age three could come from anywhere from 6.8 to $9.1 billion in annual costs. And this would accrue to parents, businesses, and taxpayers in California. And this study was done uh, last year before COVID. So the economic damage being inflicted now, you can imagine, is even worse as childcare providers across the state and across the nation have shut either temporarily or permanently. So those are the highlights of the study. I'll turn it back to Shelley. Thank you, Sandra. You appreciate welcome. that. Um, now, uh, with that startling news, I'm very pleased to introduce you to a champion for early care and education, Senator Connie Leva. Senator Leva represents the 20th Senate District and um, is serving her second term in the California Senate. She serves as chair of the Senate Education Committee, the Senate Democratic Caucus, and she's the former chair of the California Legislative Women's Caucus which placed a strong emphasis on early childhood in the previous legislative session. Senator Leva is committed to improving California's schools, environment, and communities, as well as creating quality jobs throughout the 20th State Senate District and in California. She firmly believes that California families benefit most when we invest in and help strengthen small businesses and other job drivers that create good paying jobs in our local communities, which explains her interest in uh, childcare. Uh, Senator Leva, you have led some really incredible victories on childcare and have really been a champion for many years. Would you give our audience an overview of what happened last session in regards to childcare? What do you anticipate is coming down the pike this year? We do know that Assemblymember McCarty introduced a package of bills yesterday. Uh, so if you could give us your thoughts about we, what we should be paying attention to in the next legislative cycle, we would be very grateful. Happy to do that. Uh, Shelley, thank you very much for having me and thank you all for being on this webinar and joining. Child care is essential to our economy recovering. It's essential to our economy being strong in the first place. Uh, before I get into the questions that Shelley asked me, I just want to share with you my personal story and why one of the many reasons why I am so passionate about child care. Uh, my twins were born in 1992 and I got laid off when I was six months pregnant with them and went back to work when they were a little over two years old. And when I was hired, um, the man who hired me, who was in charge, told me that if I had child care issues, I would be fired. So I has always stuck with me. My girls are 28 years old now, but I just think that I am not the only woman who has had that problem. And I think that it happens to this day. He also told me that I wasn't allowed to put any pictures up of my children in my cubicle because he didn't want people to know that I was a mom. And well, you know, I didn't get to work late. Um, late. I was always on time, but I also had pictures of my children. Sorry, you can't take mom out of the workplace. Uh, and it, that was only 28 years ago. And like I said, I know it's still happening happening now. So now being in the legislature, I have the opportunity to try and make things better. And we were in such a good place moving forward with a lot of things. Uh, and then COVID hit. Uh, we, were, we were looking at one of the things we have to do with child care is how do we make it a living wage uh, job. So many of our child care workers, pretty much all of them, don't have a living wage. And these people are doing it because they care and they love our children. We entrust them with our most precious 
things are our children, but yet we don't always take care of them. But uh, we are we are going to continue to work on that. So we know that a vaccine is um, hopefully on the horizon, but we don't know when everyone will be eligible. When we were going over the governor's master plan last week, uh, I asked when childcare providers would be given the vaccine. And I'm sorry to say that there was some, oh, we hadn't thought of that. So that's why you need all the voices at the table so that we can all make sure that everyone is being heard. Many of you probably know that it's estimated about 6,000 child care centers in the state have closed permanently. It will only make it harder for parents to go back to work. You know, uh, the Women's Caucus, as Shelley referred to, way before my time as a participant, as a chair, has always worked for more slots, make sure there's more access for women so that they can work working parents, but primarily women, because we know that women are the ones who end up giving up their jobs if there are child care issues. Unfortunately, we as a Women's Caucus estimate that probably COVID has set women back about 10 years. So we're going to have a lot more work to do. Uh, families that do not have sufficient child care lose an average of about $3,350 per parent um, each year and with women being more disproportionately impacted by those losses. So we know that it is important um, for our young children and families. They are on the forefront. Um, they have to be in the forefront of our minds and all the decisions that we make. And I know that the Women's Caucus is ready to come back strong next year. Uh, last year, while I was chair of the caucus, we worked very hard to prevent a 10% um, cut to child care reimbursement rates. That would have put so many businesses, mostly women, out of work. So I also have to give a shout out to um, former Senator Holly Mitchell, who was the budget chair at the time who really helped to make sure that that did not happen. Uh, we will continue this year as a Women's Caucus to advocate for child care again uh, in this uh, legislative year. So last year I authored SB 174, which is uh, on rates. It would have equalized the California's reimbursement formulas that are used to pay child care providers for preschool, early learning services, and child care. Currently, one formula is based on geographic location and regional costs of child care. Well, the other formula requires that a provider meet different standards to receive a flat rate regardless of where they are located. So this hurts both working families and the providers. So we didn't do it last year. I will be reintroducing it again this year because it's just imperative that we get that done. It, it has to happen. Uh, and Shelley uh, referenced the bills. I'll be working with uh, Senator Lamone and uh, Assemblymember Reyes and um, Assemblymember McCarty on the package of child care bills that they are working on. So I, I, I would just say to you that even though times are tough, you have a really great group of champions in the legislature who understands that if we don't have child care, our economy is never going to recover. And we know that child care is education. I have a granddaughter who is 14 months old, and she's learning all kinds of great things at daycare while her mom and dad are at work. So we've got to make sure that we think of our youngest individuals uh, because they will be our future leaders. So thank you for having me, Shelly. Thank you for putting this together. And you can count on me and Team Leva for whatever you need. Thank you, Senator. And we know we can count on you and we really appreciate your leadership last year that you're reintroducing your rates bill because we know, as you said, our, our providers are underpaid as it is and that those rates are so important, not only to families, but to the providers who serve them. And so um, you've, got, uh, you've got all of our members behind you um, who you're gonna hear from in just a moment. Um, but I also hope you're seeing all the great shout outs you're getting in the chat. Um, everyone on this call I know appreciates your leadership, so thank you, Senator. Uh, so now I am excited to introduce our members and um, who are strong advocates for child care and early childhood. And I'm going to start off by introducing Fight Crime Investing Kids member and Seaside Chief of Police, Abdul Pridgen. Chief Pridgen was born and raised in the Bronx. He served in, as a United States sailor in Desert Storm before being honorably discharged. After retiring from the U.S. Navy Reserve as Chief Petty Officer, Chief Pridgen went on to serve at Fort Worth, Fort Worth Police Department excuse me, in Texas before moving to Seaside, California, where he has served as Chief of Police since 2018. We're very excited to have Chief Pridgen join us uh, today. And Chief, members from Fight Crime Investing Kids have long been active in expanding and protecting after-school programs as well as early childhood initiatives. Can you share with us how you think about having access to affordable child 
quality childcare makes communities safer? Absolutely, and thank you for having me, Shelly. And I'll begin by saying I'm an even stronger advocate now because I have a seven month old at home. So I understand some of the challenges that parents face. Um, but first and foremost, um, from a law enforcement perspective, our primary responsibility is to reduce crime. And we all know that the best way and the most cost effective way to do that is to prevent young children from becoming involved in crime as they get older. And we know that there is a positive correlation between high quality childcare and language and cognitive skills in children. And this even extends through adolescence. But in California, about 14% of infants and toddlers who are eligible for childcare do not get state supported care. And about 1.8 million kids who are eligible for high quality childcare don't get it because there's no more room at the end. Spaces have filled and there's no more room for them. Well, that's concerning from a law enforcement standpoint because we know that early childcare positively contributes to a child's social and emotional development, their ability to listen to adults, um, positive behavior, and also scholastic outcomes. And that's key because we know in law enforcement that there is a strong correlation between graduation rates and crime. So for every 10 percentage point increase in graduation rates, there's an approximate 20% decrease and murder and assaults. So we understand that it's important to support and invest in programs that have proven to be efficacious for our children, particularly those that are most disadvantaged, because we want to put them on a track that's not only safer, but will allow them to be more productive citizens, which not only benefits them, but their children, our communities, and our country as a whole. So most progressive law enforcement leaders will acknowledge that our responsibility is not to, nor would we want to arrest our way out of the problem, it's to recognize where these problems originate and try to pour resources into those successful programs that will prevent people from committing crimes. So that's Head Start, that is um, uh, state uh, pre-K, and that is also high quality childcare. And our responsibility and my um, promise to you is to continually invest in programs that will uplift the most disadvantaged people in our communities and particularly children between the ages of zero and three. Thank you, Chief Pridgen. And you really uh, highlighted well the reason that Fight Crime Investing Kids started to begin with um, was the need to invest early on in our communities uh, knowing that it makes them safer and also really making your job easier in the long run. Uh, but really, it's the, it is the right thing to do for a safe community. So now I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Rear Admiral Pons. So Frank Pons retired as a Rear Admiral after serving 33 years in the United States Navy. He's, as an active member of the community, his passion and purpose is giving back and enriching the lives and youth of youth, sorry. <laughs> Admiral Pons is a member of Mission Readiness, an organization of more than 750 retired admirals and generals who advocate for investments that are proven to prepare our youth for life and to be able to serve their nation in any way they choose. And just as an aside, he's a great book reader. So Admiral Pons, Mission Readiness along with the military have always been committed to good education and health can you talk about where the issue of child care fits into this commitment? Yes, Shelley. Thanks for that kind introduction. Uh, first, allow me to say that it's a privilege to join you, Dr. Bishop, uh, Senator Leva, uh, Chief Pridgen, Ms. Parma Lohan, and Ms. Stafford Jones. Uh, this webinar is a great opportunity to draw the connection between our youth and our national security. So a huge thanks to Mission Readiness for creating this platform to discuss this critical topic. In response to your question, where does the issue of childcare fit as a commitment of our armed forces to military families, as well as government employees? The answer is straightforward and simple. Our commitment to the health and welfare of our military 
and by extension, our military families. And in this case, our young children begins at a very, very early age. See, we have a sin in the military. We recruit the individual, but we retain their families. And in doing so, we devote our time and resources to ensure that they have the quality of the life that they deserve to ensure that we, the armed forces, receive the quality of service that we require. At the highest levels, we call it covenant leadership. You see, our armed forces pride itself on many things from our technically advanced platforms to our complex weapon systems. But our greatest pride and our most precious resource is our people. Our people are the engines and the ingenuity that enable our armed forces to be the greatest there is around the world. Uh, we have great leaders leading great people. Uh, those great people are called the two percenters. Uh, that's right. Less than 2% of Americans serve in the armed forces. And that 2% must be physically fit and mentally tough to operate and survive under some very stressful conditions. And they are selected because they have demonstrated the ability to persevere during tough times. Just this Tuesday, we commemorated the heroics of our men and women during the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. You know, they and others who served during that war are often called and referred to as America's greatest generation. I believe if we are to continue and honor their legacy, we owe them a generation of men and women who are ready, willing, and equally capable of responding when their country calls. Unfortunately, today, our militaries are facing some daunting recruiting challenges, and the statistics and reasons why are quite sobering. For instance, more than 70% of California young adults, ages 17 to 24, are ineligible for military service. Hmm. Allow me to pause and let that sink in for a moment. More than seven in 10 Californians between the age of 17 and 24 are not eligible to join the military, even if they wanted to. I am sure you're asking yourselves, why not? Well, the three main reasons are a failure to meet academic standards, having serious criminal records, and being overweight or not meeting physical standards. So as a nation, we have to get after these issues with a sense of urgency at the national, state, and local levels. So what do we do? And when and where do we begin? For starters, we must engage them early on with high quality childcare programs that teach and reinforce positive life skills. There is, as others have quoted, scientific consensus that brain development begin from birth to age five and that development sets the foundation for a child's future success. Research also shows that effective child care programs help to one, create a strong educational foundation. Two, prevent obesity from instilling and creating healthy, un unhealthy habits. And three, it reduces behavioral issues. We also realize how this global health crisis, this pandemic, that we find ourselves is adversely impacting vital child care programs, and that's been stated early on. We also understand how that impact in turn threatens the state economic recovery. Within the armed forces, it is evident that working parents, military and civilian, and especially those with young children, are finding it very difficult to locate affordable, accessible, quality child care services. But there's a good news story. The good news is that even before this pandemic, the Department of Defense, your Department of Defense, my Department of Defense, our Department of Defense, had been proactively taking the steps needed to deliver that affordable, accessible, 
quality child care services to our military families and the government employees. And they do so by operating the largest employer-sponsored child care program in the United States. So why do they do it? Because the Department of Defense realized, they realized that quality child care services are part of a broader set of quality of life benefits needed to make up the total compensation package for our military families and our DOD employees. Because we realize that affording our military and civilian employees these types of benefits are essential to meeting recruiting, retention, and readiness goals, we are proactive in doing so. So how do we do it? Well, in areas such as San Diego, here we have a large military population. The Department of Defense subsidizes private child care centers and family child care homes outside of military installations. Those subsidies enable those, those cares and those homes and those facilities and centers to operate, sometimes under budget, without going underwater. Unfortunately, the reality is this supply and demand market in this market in this market, demand is beginning to outpace supply. As a member of Mission Readiness, I believe that a commitment to quality child care is a commitment to a solid education and good health. Allow me to take that comment one step further. The health and welfare of our youth are directly linked to our national security interests. So we must commit and continue to recommit our efforts and our resources to ensure that our armed forces has a pool of healthy and skilled candidates who are eligible and ready to serve our country when that time comes. Listen, this is not just mission essential. This is a moral imperative that demands our immediate and utmost attention. Like I always say, the time is now, and now is the time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Admiral. We very much appreciate your advocacy, your strong words in support of um, access to childcare. And you can see, Senator Leva, why we've got some good advocates for you when you need them. We'll be, we'll be ready. <laughs> uh, and now I'm very pleased uh, to introduce our Ready Nation member, Laura Palmer-Lohan. Laura uh, is Chief of Staff at Amgen, biotech company in the Bay Area. And uh, she's my neighbor, actually, <laughs> as well, which is nice. Uh, Laura also currently serves as the, as the Vice Mayor of San Carlos and is the mom of two kids and I know has also experienced the childcare issues as she's been in her work, both as a, um, someone who works and then as someone who is an employer. So, so Laura, can you talk to us from a business perspective why you think the issue of the childcare crisis is important and what are some of the initiatives your company's taking on to address the needs of your employees? Thank you, Shelley, for your question. Um, first off, let me just say that I'm very honored to be a part of such a distinguished panel and talk to you about this very important, uh, what I'll call call to action. <laughs> um, as Shelley shared, I have dedicated my career to working in the private sector and now more recently the public sector. I serve as chief of staff for Amgen. And what that means is that my job is to essentially clear the path for our scientists so that they can fulfill the mission of Amgen, which is serving patients. When it comes to childcare, regrettably, the status of the current capacity in California is in crisis. I understand why we are in this situation and that there's a compelling economic reason to do much better. <clears throat> Ready Nation, of which I'm a member, is an organization of 3,000 business leaders across the country dedicated to advocating for building a stronger workforce and economy. At the heart of our work is a focus on what you've heard today, early care and education, which helps our kids develop the skills they need to play well with others. After all, we all know <laughs> that playing well with others is critical to lifelong success and paramount to a productive labor force, as is academic su success and social emotional skills. 
In an information and service-based economy like ours, we need a labor force that can think critically, listen well, and interact well with others. Most brain development for a child occurs in the first five years. Therefore, extending quality childcare and education to all children will help to ensure the workforce is skilled and ready to compete in our global economy. Research has shown that high quality early education programs have a positive impact for some of the most underserved children. Unfortunately, there are gaps in our childcare system that are locking too many children and their parents out. Businesses are impacted by the childcare crisis by reductions in revenue, an increase in hiring costs, loss of productivity, especially when a parent has to miss work or when families have to relocate to be closer to better childcare options. We heard earlier today that the Ready Nation California report states that businesses lose an average of $1,150 per working parent in reduced revenue and extra hiring costs. And Senator Leva uh, articulated that families in particular lose thousands of dollars themselves. These realities result in a projected annual cost of $9 billion in California. That amount is staggering and we can't emphasize that enough on this uh, panel. This is due to the impact of parents of infants and toddlers struggling to find affordable quality childcare um, or, it, it, or also the, the replacement costs when those parents drop out of the workforce because they can't find that childcare. And we know that that's happening um, in the thousands uh, at this point in time with the pandemic. Ultimately, there is lower revenues and lost productivity. From an economic perspective, addressing the childcare needs of our labor force allows employers and employees many benefits. So let's take a look at what Amgen is doing to address this issue. So prior to the pandemic, Amgen had a robust set of uh, benefits to staff. One is its partnership with Bright Horizons, which is a national operation, operator of childcare facilities across the country. In addition, Amgen offers uh, access to babysitters, nannies, tutors, elder care, and pet sitters in the US uh, through a database. Um, the company offers generous time off and paid company holidays. Now, when COVID hit and the schools were closed, we, held, we heard directly from staff about what the stress was that that placed on them because now they were suddenly in charge of managing distance learning for their children or their children uh, were taken out of childcare. So based on staff feedback, the company responded by providing additional company paid holidays for US staff in 2020. Additional virtual webinars and platforms for caregivers to connect virtually and to talk to each other about how to form learning pods was uh, established. We also emphasized with our managers the importance of working with their staff to make sure that they can address caregiver needs, whatever uh, situation it was, as I mentioned before, um, so that our now schedules are very flexible. We're not requiring staff to come in at a certain time of day or leave at a certain time of day. The workforce we have at Amgen is extremely talented. They're driven, they're well-equipped, and they thrive in, in our company, um, as well as our overall workforce. But the fact remains, if our staff aren't gonna be able to do their best work, if they're worried about what's happening with their kids while they're at work. So with that, I think it's important that we all need to advocate for change, and that's why I'm so pleased to be a part of this discussion today. And with that, Shelly, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thanks so much for all the work you're also leading at Amgen. I know one of the other things you've been doing is exploring, could you even locate a child care center someplace close by, if not on site? So I uh, appreciate all of your advocacy and, and thoughtfulness around providing access to working families. Our final panelist is Melissa Stafford-Jones, uh, the Executive Director of the First Five Association. She leads strategy in the direction of the association, which represents the 58 county First Five commissions, as well as its complementary foundation and the First, first Five Center for Children's Policy. Prior to joining the association, Melissa was the Executive Director of the Dean and Margaret Lesher Foundation, where she develops strategic initiatives for systems change to address the root causes of poverty and inequitable access to opportunity for low-income children and families in Contra Costa County. Obviously quite relevant to the discussion today. So Melissa, my question for you is, as the ED of an organization that represents the needs of children across our state, 
what are some of the biggest challenges children and families are currently facing when it comes to child care? And we've got a, a webinar full of advocates. What can these advocates do to help with these challenges? <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you to Council for Strong America and affiliate members for the invitation. I'm really honored to be able to join you today to talk about these important issues. And COVID has highlighted what we have known for a long time. A child's well-being is inextricably connected to their parent and caregiver's well-being. And an essential ingredient to supporting children and parents is the ability of stable, safe, and loving child care. So to directly answer Shelley's thoughtful question, you know, the biggest challenge is the multitude of challenges and stressors that families are facing. Increased food insecurity, loss of stable housing or fear of eviction, unemployment and job loss, mounting mental and behavioral health concerns from isolation and prolonged stress, just to name a few examples. And some of you may have seen that the California Budget and Policy Center released some new reports this week with findings that emphasize these very concerning impacts on children and families on very basic issues. And all of these issues have impacts on a family's ability to make ends meet and a child's development trajectory and, of course, our economy overall. For first five commissions across the state, these interconnections really inform our approach of a whole child, whole family framework that guides all of our programmatic systems and policy work. It also emphasizes the need to strengthen our cross-sector partnerships, which organizations like Council for a Strong America so clearly demonstrate and excel at that we all have to be doing this work together. So thank you again for this conversation today. And we all know that COVID has heightened deep-seated and long-standing inequities across all of our communities. The digital divide has widened, job loss has been mostly shouldered by low-income earners, and the learning gap is only likely to widen among students farthest from opportunities to begin with. Our safety net systems are revealing heightened racial inequities as well, showing that people of color are experiencing worse outcomes from the pandemic and the economic recession. While we don't know the full outcome yet, we anticipate that the resulting stress and trauma for young children and families, especially families of color, will take its toll for years to come. And this is the critical context for our policy and advocacy work together ahead. So how can advocates help? I'd like to highlight two opportunities and just emphasize that first I welcomes the opportunity to partner with everyone on this webinar and all who care and believe in supporting children to advance our collective goals to stabilize, support, and expand childcare. And I'm really honored to be on this call with all of the leaders in this, in this work. Our economic recovery, as has been discussed, will hinge on the availability of childcare. And right now we are losing, not gaining access to care. First, the California Master Plan on Early Learning and Care was released last week which provides 10-year goals for how to expand early learning and care. Once fully implemented, this long-awaited document will benefit millions of children and families for years to come through universal pre-K for four-year-olds, expanded access for three-year-olds, expanded paid family leave, and streamlined eligibility for family support services. We must work together to ensure this plan is implemented immediately and prioritized in any policy discussion but we can't stop there. We still need to push together for expansion of infant toddler care. Of course, the most expensive type of care and the most difficult to find, as has been discussed today. Better connect and integrate early learning with health, child development, and family strengthening services, but so clearly have an impact on a child's ability to learn. And ensure that the plan is implemented in a way that addresses and accounts for the growing racial disparities across our communities. Last year, the legislature stepped up in a big way to support child care during last year's budget negotiations. Obviously, Senator Leva was such a critical leader in that work. Thank you, Senator. Not only did the legislature, um, with champions like Senator Leva, identify other funding solutions to avoid cuts proposed in the May revise, but they dedicated new funding to keep providers whole, compensate them for increased costs associated with providing care during the pandemic, waived family fees, and increased access to PPE and cleaning supplies. These financial supports must continue in order for us to maintain our current childcare field and to support essential workers who are parents. 
And second, we must also look to the federal government and demand that the child care field receive the small business and financial supports necessary to keep children learning, parents working, and the economy moving. During previous recessions, the federal government responded quickly to collapsing industries, and child care should be no different. All sectors of our economy benefit and depend on the availability of child care. And this too is an equity issue, given that the majority of child care providers are minority and women-owned small businesses. Our members of Congress need to hear from our cross-sector partners that child care must be included in the next COVID-19 response stimulus package. In the end, I do believe that together we can meet the needs of families and young children, make sure they are prioritized in a way that meets this very challenging moment. It will take courage and perseverance, and we know hard work and cross-sector leaders like all of the folks on this call, using our positions to truly center the needs of children and families and push for their prioritization in all policy conversations ahead. And before I close, I just do want to follow up on one important issue that Senator Leiva raised during her comments on the need to ensure that child care workers are prioritized in receiving the COVID vaccine. Um, I and many others are serving on a community advisory committee that the state formed a couple of weeks ago related to vaccine allocation and distribution. In fact, our next meeting is at three o'clock today. <laughs> and I know for me as a representative of the First Five Association and others who are on that group as well, are really emphasizing the importance that child care workers are essential workers that must be prioritized in distribution of the vaccine. That it's a matter of safety and equity. And as we've talked about today, it's key to the recovery for families and the economy because it is so inter woven with all the other workers, essential workers in other parts of the economy being able to recover and reopen. So thank you again for the opportunity to join you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for your advocacy and also thank you for your work on that task force and reminding us that um, child care workers are essential workers. And that's the whole reason actually that we chose this timing for this uh, for this release of this report, because as we know, we know as the legislature is going back in session, uh, as the governor's about to release his budget, it's really important to understand that an investment in child care is an investment in our economy. And so making sure that uh, we all are raising our voices now and continue to raise them and support our champions like Senator Leva uh, as the legislature goes back in session is gonna be really critical. Um, so we have a few questions, panelists, if you are, if you're up for it, which I hope you are. <laughs> uh, so the first question we have is, what strategies should we employ in order to convince lawmakers at the federal and state level to commit to allocation specifically for quality child care and family leave? And Melissa, you talked a little bit about that in your remarks, but I wonder, Senator, if you have some advice for all of us as we start talking to policymakers, uh, what, what, do you, what do you need from us and what do you, your colleagues need to hear? That is a great question. Uh, the first thing I will say is who you elect matters. Uh, we just uh, finished an election cycle in November. When you are talking to people who are running for office, you have to ask them, will you make sure there's an allocation for childcare in the budget? Um, just because you like this person, just because this person has kids, um, does not mean they are going to be a child care advocate when they get to the, the Senate or the Assembly. You know, anytime, we, we tried to pass family leave, we did pass it, the governor vetoed it, but trying to get that off the Senate floor was so incredibly hard. All we needed was 21 votes. The Chamber of Commerce does an awesome job of saying any bill that helps working families is a job killer. Uh, for me personally, as a legislator, pretty much all of my bills are labeled job killers by the uh, Chamber of Commerce, which for me is a badge of honor. But a lot of legislators are actually threatened by that. So we need all of you candidly putting pressure on us that this is what we need. I think we need to hold up companies like Amgen. Oh my gosh, what a great example of what should be happening because there is study after study that shows that when parents have access to affordable childcare or the company provides it, I would be willing to bet, Laura, you would say that your employees are more productive and they, they will do a better job. The company will be more productive. Allocating money strictly for childcare I have heard for, I will not name the person because I don't know if they want it to be out there, 
um, that we may look at a vaping tax and the money from that would go directly for childcare. So that may be a stream, a revenue stream that is coming, but I just think I can't impress enough on the importance of putting pressure on us as lawmakers, that we need to do our job and we need to make sure we are prioritizing childcare, we are um, prioritizing our next generation. And you really, again, it, it all goes back to who you elect. So when you're thinking about voting for somebody, when you're thinking about endorsing somebody, please make sure you talk to them about childcare and make sure that they will be willing, willing to vote for family leave. The family leave that we had a hard time getting off the floor wasn't even paid leave. All it said is that you could take time off to care for your infant child or a sick family member. We we're like the only country or um, the only uh, country that doesn't do that other than third world countries. So I could go on and on because I really get frustrated with folks that don't do the right thing when they have the power of their vote. Put pressure on us. Make us do the right thing. Thank you, Senator. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons that Ready Nation we feel is so powerful is that we do, our members, our business leaders do advocate for childcare because they do recognize that the economic impacts of it and the importance to their workforce. So thanks for uh, pointing out uh, Laura again and Amgen and all of our other Ready Nation members across the state and uh, across the country. Um, and actually, I think I'm going to pose this question to all three of our members, to our fart crime um, and mission readiness and ready nation. We have a question about how we pull in allies that may feel like they're not affected by this issue. So, for example, people who are not parents or providers, um, you all did a great job of outlining your reasons for joining. And do you have any suggestions for us as we go out and talk to other people about how we might um, continue to amplify uh, people's voices. Who wants to take that one? So uh, this is Abdul, I'll weigh in. The, the way that I would suggest is that you frame it in a way that directly impacts them, even though they might not have a child, even though they might not be thinking about having children, but the fact that if they don't invest in this resource for the community, how it could potentially impact them down the road. And if they see that tangible connection between the outcome and their interests, whatever they are, I think they're more likely to support it. But if it's just an abstract where they don't have any tangible connection, they're less likely to support it. I want to say, if I can jump in, that I think the chief is 100% right. Um, we had problems with Governor Brown, who loved to release people early from jail and whatnot and do a lot of work there, which is wonderful. But we used to say to him, you know, if you do the work on the front end, you don't have to worry about doing the work on the back end. And he did not have children, nor did his wife. So sometimes that concept was lost on him. And he said to me one time, do you really think that that's true? I said, well, not only do I think it's true, true there's lots of studies that prove that it's true so i think to the chief's point even if people don't have children you can show them that if we start it, it benefits the whole community thank you admiral yes so i mean there are so many different programs and processes out there that's ongoing right now i think most often we fail to stop and take notice and note of what we are doing to see what works and what works well so in the military, we often do what we call a SWOT analysis. Act. And what we do is we look at the things that are strengths, the things that may be a weakness to those programs and those processes. And that sort of reveals the opportunities to what can we do in the future that may improve the situation we find ourselves. And in doing that, we can also unearth the threats to what we're trying to achieve, that mission. So, a careful analysis and introspection of what we may do in the future. So a SWOT analysis, is, I mean, that is just something we practice. It's, it's something we do on a routine basis. But I think it would be something that would be very, very Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Um, we had a question about um, rates. And so uh, the question is about, you know, there's a lot of things to be done and there were a lot of uh, things in the, uh, in the master plan that, uh, was, re that was released. Um, but the, our rates are still quite low. And um, so I know, Senator, you, 
you had your bill last year and you're reintroducing your bill this year on, on rates. But the question is, uh, how do we elevate addressing rates as a priority? Do you, any, any, anything different than what you've uh, talked about before? Any, um, anybody, Melissa, I don't know if you wanted to jump in on that either. No, we just, I mean, is this something we have to do? The, the person who wrote the question uh, knows their stuff. It's exactly right. We are asking our child care providers to do so much with so little. And again, it goes to prioritization. Don't tell me what your priorities are. Show me where you spend your money and I'll tell you what your priorities are. So true. As, as uh, our friend Elaine Easton always says, uh, budget is a, um, is a manifestation of your priorities, right? And your values. So um, there's also a question about tax incentives for employers to provide employer funded childcare. Um, Laura, I don't know if you know anything about that or if um, Melissa or Senator Leva, you wanted to jump in on that? Well, you know, I just always have lots to say, so I'm happy to jump in. <laughs> That is incredibly important, and that is again a budget issue, and we just uh, we just have to make sure that people um, do the right thing. I mean, it's really it, I, I just can't state it enough that you have to expect more from your elected officials. You pay our salary through your taxes, so our job is to work for you. Laura, did you want to add something? Yeah, I'll just add to it. So, I mean, one of the things to, so our, the site that I work at is uh, Oyster Point, and there's been a lot of development um, going into the Oyster Point area as part of South San Francisco. And many years ago, South San Francisco asked developers to either pay um, a fee uh, for childcare um, uh, capacity or uh, build it. And um, you know, there's not a lot of developers who've actually chosen to build it, <laughs> unfortunately. And so right now, money is sitting in a trust fund awaiting activation. Uh, however, I will say that from what I'm hearing from developers is that they're starting to understand these issues that are being talked about on this call today in terms of what the what's it what's the cost to us and what are the benefits to us to do the right thing right to ensure that our community is thought of holistically and that we care for everybody not just a few and so they are starting to consider um, the build out of child care facilities uh, when they do these larger developments and i would echo everything uh, the panelists have said here before which is you know advocate 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 if if the governing um uh, body that you are talking to doesn't understand the issue or the implications on the community um, and you are directly impacted share your stories with them because that will activate and motivate change um, I know just in the short few months since the pandemic has uh, taken effect that this conversation has uh, risen in terms of its um, kind of loudness I should say and uh, frequency so please continue um, and develop those stories and those narratives to help everyone understand what's at stake. I would just quickly add, we actually have a good model for tax breaks for companies to do the right thing. Uh, we do it in the film industry. If they keep people working in California, they film in California, they get a tax break. But what we do is we make, the, they don't get it until after they have done the right thing. So we could absolutely do the same thing for companies that are willing to provide childcare. So, I also like to say it's not a lack of how to, it's a lack of will to. So we have to find people that have the will to do it. Yeah, I would just add, I do think that we have seen some either new or strengthened conversations and partnerships between local first five commissions and their business communities as the impact on childcare and on business has really just been highlighted through the impact of the pandemic. And so perhaps there's some opportunity to really support and nurture those partnerships in a way that could help um, press and advocate for some of the things we're talking about today. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. And Laura, thanks for raising the local government issue. And I'll just share in my city, um, one of the things that we really have done with developers is talk to them about the importance of including childcare in new developments that they bring forth. And so that message has gotten out loud and clear in a development that was just approved that includes office, housing, retail, and affordable housing also includes uh, almost 9,000 square feet for childcare. The developer is going to build out the interior of the facility 
uh, as well as provide uh, 10 years, uh, the facility for 10 years with no rent. Um, so that, and that was working in partnership with local child care advocates to understand what were the needs of the providers and hearing very loud and clear from our city council that um, it was critical importance to, uh, to council to have childcare uh, in the city. So it's a, it's a great, it's all levels of government, right? That we need to be, that we need to be advocating at. Um, so I don't think we have any, I think we've answered all of the questions. So, and we're just about at time. So I wanna start off by thanking our panelists again. Um, I will do, I will clap uh, because you guys can see me. Um, but I hope you all are clapping in your homes. And I wanna thank all of you, um, Senator Leva, Chief Pridgen, Rear Admiral Pons, Laura, um, Palmer Lohan, Melissa Stafford-Jones for your critical work and advocacy on behalf of our kids. Um, Sandra Bishop, our Dr. Bishop, our research director, as I said, she makes all of our work possible because now we know what we can talk about. So thank you, Sandra, for being with us today. Um, and thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you to my staff. I really need to just quickly call out uh, Magali uh, Flores, Patrick Mortier, Donna Cullinan. Thank you guys so much for organizing today. Uh, the, our national staff, Sarah Fisher, Tamar, and Tom, uh, all of you, thank you so much for your work to make this all possible. Um, these things take, as I think everybody has learned, a lot of people to make them seem easy. And uh, so we very much appreciate all of the behind scenes report, uh, re work that's happened. Um, we've put links to our new report, to uh, a letter to the federal delegation on uh, including childcare in the next pandemic response or in the chat. You can go to our website site, strongnation.org. Uh, join us in our advocacy for childcare over this coming year. Uh, Senator, you can look forward to seeing this webinar group of people and all of us uh, with you and supporting all of the bills for childcare. So thank you everyone for being here. Have a great rest of your day.